students welcome to today's session in today's session i have chosen a very commonly occurring condition in the pediatric opd which is why parents bring their children to the opd most often that is the pediatric respiratory tract infections so what are our learning objectives for today at the end of the session you will be able to discuss the etiopathogenesis clinical features and management of four different conditions and what i have chosen is what is important for you on a regular basis be it the icu or the opd or the ward and they are epiglottitis acute laryngotracheobronchitis bronchiolitis and the variety of spectrum in pneumonias so let's begin how have we outlined the session all the sessions have been outlined similarly we'll be beginning each of these with a the clinical case scenario proceeding with the introduction of the condition the etiopathogenesis the clinical features the complications the relevant investigations the management options and finally i'll conclude with the summary take home message and my test time so let's begin with the clinical case scenario 1 now here we have a 2 year old boy who presented to the casualty looking very sick his mother says he was fine in the morning and since afternoon he complained of sore throat and fever by the evening the child had become dull he has had difficulty in breathing with drooling of saliva with refusal to eat or drink along with this the mother has noted a temperature of 104 degrees fahrenheit Other relevant history is that child has been immunized for age and his development is normal. On examination, he has a heart rate of 160. Noted there is tachycardia. Heart rate is 160. Respiratory rate is 40 per minute, which means for a two-year-old, this is on the upper limit of normal. Temperature is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. He has a weight of 12 kgs and a height of 89 centimeters. He has no pallor, ichthyosis, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy. edema on head to toe examination everything was normal on systemic examination what did we find we found that the child is sitting in tripod position now what is tripod tripod position is a position where the child is hunched forward with his hands kept in front of him neck is hyper extended and child is struggling to breathe this is tripod position with respect to the respiratory tract he has deep suprasternal suprasternal is seen just at the base of the neck deep suprasternal retractions along with this we also noted intercostal and subcostal retractions there was a mild inspiratory stridor noted apart from this the chest appeared clear on auscultation now in this history what you must understand is that there was mild inspiratory stridor however the chest was clear other systems were within normal limits so now this is a case was come to you how would you analyze this case Now we have a child who is apparently normal looking so far healthy and he suddenly becomes sick and he has had sudden onset of stridor what did we find we found that the child has history of associated fever not less 104 degrees fahrenheit and the child is sick dull and toxic looking and when you look back in the history there is no history of sudden choking the mother did not say that all this happened after a sudden choking of some particle of food or anything was there in the mouth So on examination what did we find we found a sick toxic child who has drooling of saliva and sitting in the tripod position now remember when we have drooling of saliva this drooling is a very important sign it shows that the child is unable to swallow and swallowing of saliva is a natural process there is nothing active in the swallow of saliva so when a child is drooling saliva and unable to swallow it means there's some significant inflammation or edema occurring in the upper airway and throat which is why the child is unable to swallow his own saliva and he is drooling it out so with this what is your most probable diagnosis the most probable diagnosis in this case becomes acute epiglottitis so what is acute epiglottitis Epi acute epiglottitis is defined as acute inflammation of the epiglottis now for those who have forgotten their anatomy as to what this epiglottis is where this stands here is the sagittal section of the head and neck now here you have this big structure is the tongue okay now when you look down onto the neck you you can see this structure this structure is the epiglottis this structure is the epiglottis and here you have the upper airway so here you have the trachea and going on to the airway below now you see this epiglottis guards a very narrow inlet so it guards the laryngeal inlet 
and that's why any swelling of the epiglottis makes the epiglottis very heavy. Once the epiglottis is heavy, it no longer can flip and flop. With every inspiration it opens and every expiration when there is a swallow of the saliva, it closes. So when it becomes heavy and swollen with edema, what happens is unable to flip flop like that. The heaviness of the epiglottis makes it weigh down on the laryngeal inlet, thus narrowing the laryngeal inlet. So when you have a narrow laryngeal inlet, the breathing through that narrow area is what causes the strider. What are the etiopathogenesis of epiglottitis? The commonest cause of epiglottitis has been Haemophilus influenzae. So all your textbooks will say Haemophilus influenzae. But however, this was the pre-vaccination era. Now what is more common is the group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. Essentially both are very similarly occurring bacteria. So initially it was Haemophilus influenzae. Now with the pentavalent, with the pentavalent vaccine, you have immunization with diphtheria. Pertussis, tetanus, hepatitis B and Haemophilus influenzae B. So this vaccination is going on very well all over the country in the government program. That is why Haemophilus influenzae is slowly reducing and is no longer one of the commonest causes of epiglottitis and is slowly being replaced by group A beta hemolytic streptococci. Rarely we have other causes, they are non-infectious causes like trauma. We have children who are mouthing as a habit. In mouthing, children like to put various objects in their mouth as they explore the environment. These are the small children, around one and a half to two years of age. So putting a pencil in the mouth, all these sharp objects can sometimes injure the epiglottis. I have seen a case where the child was walking with an ice cream or popsicle stick in the mouth and fell down. When the child fell down, the popsicle stick tends to injure the epiglottis. And that child also presented very similarly, albeit without fever. Chemical burns, when we have chemical burns, even our routine disinfectants which we use in the house, those all are very toxic chemicals and when they are applied for cleaning, especially when the bathrooms in an overtly interested environment to keep the household sanitized, there can be chemical burns because the vaporizing of these chemicals and that can cause inflammation of the epiglottis. Many of the people even complain of choking like sensation when they use these chemicals to clean the houses and bathrooms. So for small children, even this can be a chemical burn. This results in inflammatory edema of the arytenoids, airy epiglottic folds and finally the epiglottis. So ideally the term epiglottitis is a very narrow term. So what is the correct term and the preferred term? The correct and preferred term is supraglottitis because the epiglottis just guards the inlet and around the laryngeal inlet, you have the airy epiglottic folds and the arytenoids at the back. All of it gets inflamed and that's why the net radius and diameter of that airway reduces because the entire diameter gets inflamed. Acute bacterial epiglottitis, what results? It soon results in early bacteremia and sepsis. And because of this is the toxic presentation of the child where a child was perfectly normal in the morning Suddenly, lungs are becoming sick and dull with drooling of saliva by the evening because this epiglottis is a very vascular organ. So, acute inflammation because of all these scary bacteria there can result in sepsis and toxicity of the child. Now, what are the clinical features of epiglottitis? First, most important, you have an acutely sick, toxic looking child who was apparently well and suddenly became very sick. There is high grade fever. Remember in the case we had the temperature is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The child complains of a minimal sore throat initially and that rapidly progresses to very significant odinophagia. Odinophagia is also called painful swallowing. So that becomes very painful and every time that pain causes the child to try and restrict swallow as much as possible and that's why the saliva is not swallowed and drools out. Drooling of saliva because of the severe odinophagia. The tripod position which is what I showed you. The tripod position is where the child keeps his hands in front of him and tries to support his back and keeps the neck extended. This is the position in which the airway is open at its maximum and the epiglottis is pushed back. So that tripod position the child sits in to keep his neck extended so that his airway is held open. That is because he also perceives that in that position maximum air enters into the lung and that strider is minimum in that position. So tripod position. 
stridor eventually develops and finally there is shortness of breath. As the airway becomes more and more narrow, there will be shortness of breath and respiratory distress. On examination, what do you find? You find tachycardia because of sepsis. Along with that, you also have high grade fever. You have tachypnea because the airway inlet is becoming narrow and, in, and also respiratory distress where you have stridor and intercostal subcostal retractions. Remember this is a mnemonic to remember what are the clinical key features of acute epiglottitis. They are the four Ds. The four Ds are for dysphagia, dysphonia because this area, the vocal cords also in the same area. So there also there is inflammatory edema. So there is dysphonia, there is drooling and there is respiratory distress. So they are the four Ds of epiglottitis. How do you come to a diagnosis? Remember acute epiglottitis is a clinical emergency. So, there is no need for us to go and search and put a tongue depressor into the mouth and see that the epiglottis is swollen. All these clinical features should suggest to you that this is a case of epiglottitis. Have a high index of suspicion in these children because if you try to examine the epiglottis on an OPD basis or in the ward basis, you can precipitate acute laryngospasm. Because the epiglottis can is so swollen and edematous, any injury when you are trying to insert a tongue depressor can cause bleeding, can cause the epiglottis to fall back on the larynx and cause the laryngeal inlet to close. That is why never examine a child in whom you suspect acute epiglottitis in the OPD or ward. Always the examination should be in an ICU setting or in an operation theatre setting where you have facilities for things like intubation or tracheostomy should the need arise. That's what I have mentioned here. Examination to be done only in an ICU setting and not in an OPD setting. You must have backup intubation facilities as well as the ENT for tracheostomy if ever required. In cases where the child is stable, a lateral view of the neck can be taken. Now, there are some children where the child doesn't actually come so late. Child comes much earlier to you. That time, extra lateral view of neck is taken and this shows the characteristic thumb sign of epiglottis. Now, the thumb sign of the swollen epiglottitis is a condition like this. Now, what I have decided to show you was first a normal x-ray. Now, this is the, now this is normal x-ray lateral view, okay. This is a normal x-ray lateral view. Now, here, if you can notice, there is this area. Now, this area is where the epiglottis is and you can see the airway is clearly delineated along the neck. The black area what you can see throughout, if you can see my cursor go, the black area is what denotes the airway. Now, you can see this. Now, this is what happens when the epiglottis gets swollen. This is the swollen epiglottis. And this swollen epiglottis looks like a thumb and this is called the thumb sign of epiglottitis. So, you will find that this laryngeal inlet, that small thin feather like appearance which the normal epiglottis has as a soft tissue is lost and there is an indistinct thick thumb like area in that place. That is the swollen epiglottis. Remember, you should not delay managing the child for view of the x-ray. Diagnosis is albeit clinical only. This can be done in stable children. Now coming to the management of acute epiglottitis.